Cambridge Forum presents Are Japan and America Enemies? The basic Cambridge Forum co-sponsors are The First Parish in Cambridge, Unitarian Universalist The Lowell Institute, Boston The United Ministry at Harvard and Radcliffe, Interfaith The MIT Chaplains, Interfaith Support for this program is from The First Parish in Cambridge the Sasakawa Foundation, the Lowell Institute. Just because somebody's competing with us doesn't necessarily mean that they're threatening us. The Japanese market is tough, but it's a good market. Japan's success is American success. We do not say that other countries' system is wrong because it's not the same as our own. Please export your entertainment to Japan. <laughs> we enjoy it. Welcome to a special Cambridge Forum broadcast presented by Cambridge Forum, co-sponsored by the Institute of Politics of Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. This forum is in honor of Edwin O. Reischauer, the late former United States ambassador to Japan, who taught at Harvard, and who was America's preeminent historian of Japan. He has emphasized that Japan is a country which it is most important for us to know, and yet we know so little. The issue before us is, are Japan and America enemies? I'm Herb Vetter the retiring director of Cambridge Forum and a chaplain to Harvard University. Our moderator is Marvin Kalb, the distinguished television journalist who is the director of Harvard's Center on Press, Politics, and Public Policy. Professor Kalb. Thank you, Thank you very much. Reverend Vetter has already told us what the question is. Are Japan and America enemies? That is a very provocative question, and we're going to deal with it in a very serious way. The program is going to be divided into three parts. Each part will be introduced by a videotape package that will run about five minutes. The packages, all three of them, have been prepared by Paul Solman, who is the economics correspondent for the McNeil Era News Hour. Our panelists are Mr. Sadami Wada, who is the Senior Vice President of the Sony Corporation in New York, Mr. William Rapp, Vice Chairman in Charge of Mergers, Acquisitions, and Finance at the Mitsui Nevitt Capital Corporation in New York, George Packard, the Dean of the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C., Mr. Motoi Shina, until recently a member of the House of Representatives of the Japanese Parliament with special responsibilities and expertise in matters of defense. Ms. Yoriko Kawaguchi, Minister for Commerce at the Embassy of Japan in Washington, D.C., and Joseph Nye, Professor of International Security and Director of the Center for International Affairs here at Harvard University. I think at this point the best thing we can do is go directly to the first videotape package uh, the question leading into that package is this one. Does Japanese success threaten America? It should come as no surprise that U.S. and Japanese attitudes differ on this question. We're going to sketch both sides of the debate, some American criticisms of the Japanese and some Japanese responses to those criticisms. We start off with one of America's better-known protectionists. You know what I think? I think America is getting an inferiority complex about Japan. Everything from Japan is perfect. Everything from America is lousy. The Chrysler Corporation's Lee Iacocca wants to convince Americans that his product is just as good as the Japanese. Unfortunately, it's a pretty hard sell. American auto firms have been losing business to Japan for years now. American auto workers tend to blame the Japanese for the loss of their jobs. African Americans have been especially hard hit. Here in Detroit, the auto workers' charge is that the Japanese compete unfairly, with, among other things, 
their workaholic culture. They've had centuries and centuries and centuries of living the way they do. America isn't like that. We can't work like that. To the Japanese, comments like this are a cop-out. Why can't Americans work like Japanese, who, after all, learned many of their current business techniques from Americans to begin with? And now the Japanese say they're simply bringing American management methods back home. To the Toyota GM joint venture in California, for instance. This plant has proved to be one of the most productive in the entire GM system. Moreover, the Japanese point out, the likes of Toyota, Nissan, and Honda are creating factories and jobs in America, where American companies often aren't. But cars and work habits are only one source of the U.S.-Japan conflict. American businessmen claim the Japanese market is closed to them. American rice farmers, for example, would love to sell Japan their surplus rice. But Japanese rice farmers, like these demonstrators, have kept up the pressure on Japanese politicians and the total ban on foreign rice. But the real problem Americans charge goes beyond simple protectionism. The real problem is the clubby Japanese system, which only Japanese can seem to master. A system shot through with technicalities and personal relationships, a system that foreigners can't seem to crack. Now, the Japanese response is that Americans are simply never satisfied. Japan has removed most formal restrictions, even on sensitive agricultural products like oranges and beef. We're changing, say the Japanese. And the decreasing U.S. trade deficit with Japan, they argue, proves their point. Moreover, say the Japanese, Americans with top-notch products and sensitivity to the Japanese market can compete, and do. America's Lotus Corporation, the maker of 123 software, is among the many U.S. companies successfully doing business in Japan today. Lotus specially adapted 123 for the Japanese market and has been profiting handsomely for years. Okay, charge number three. The Japanese are buying up America. Not American products, but American assets. Real estate, for example, from Rockefeller Center in New York to the Bonaventure in Los Angeles. And the Japanese are buying American corporations as well. When U.S. media giant MCA was taken over by Matsushita, Japan's biggest electronics firm, Japan became the proud owner of America's most treasured extraterrestrial. Oh. Even Motown Records, an MCA subsidiary, is now in Japanese hands. The fear is that with foreign owners calling the shots, American economic and cultural independence are now in jeopardy. To many Japanese, such fears are pure paranoia. They point out that America has been exporting its culture for generations and continues to do so. In Tokyo Disneyland. Moreover, Japanese feel that they're being unfairly singled out. In 1989, for example, the English bought nearly twice as many U.S. firms as the Japanese did. No one raised an eyebrow. Besides, say Japanese, their money is simply an investment in the United States so that American companies can make more and better products. Finally, Japanese point out, Americans have been courting them for years, learning the fine points of Japanese etiquette in an effort to encourage investment in the U.S. My name is Sid Keels. How do you do? Nice to meet you. We finish this brief summary with a last American fear. The Japanese success in modern technologies will shut America out in the economic future. Two current worries are HDTV, high definition television, where Japan has forged a big lead, and biotechnology, a stronghold of innovative U.S. firms like Maryland's Daijin here, in which the Japanese have been investing heavily. But to Japanese, like Mitsubishi Petrochemical, the investor in Daijin, this same footage illustrates not a competition, but a partnership. And after all is said and done, many Japanese would argue that what we're seeing is not a takeover from abroad, but a teaming up of East and West that is historically inevitable and long overdue. Wow.
Well, in a relatively brief period of time, Paul Solman has certainly addressed and raised a number of serious questions, and I would like to ask each member of our panel, starting with Mr. Wada, uh, to uh, address some of those issues and give us his own judgment. Well, I think uh, uh, Sony has been successful, but that is uh, like Japan has been economically successful, but that has been only because we have had a good American friend. To begin with, going back to after the war, uh, Japan had lots of learnings from you. I remember Japan Productivity Center sent a delegation after delegation to the United States to learn how to increase productivity. Productivity also led us to learn quality is very important. You can have a good productivity, but if your quality is bad, who would buy such a product? All those things we learned from America. Now, is such success uh, to be considered a threat to the United States? Not at all. In the United States, over 300,000 American friends are working with us. Uh, many Japanese companies, you call Japanese, but really American companies. I worked for four American presidents over decades. My company have 97% of American employees. I work for American executives. How could such companies could uh, ignore benefit and success for United States of America? I have to be careful about the time. I think this is where I should stop. <laughs> I could go on and on. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill Rapp? We're dealing with a very large, very pluralistic relationship. This is an issue of competition. In other words, th just because somebody's competing with us doesn't necessarily mean that they're threatening us. We should be learning how to respond to that competition. Whether or not, I'm sure Ford complains about General Motors, and I'm sure that they also complain about Mercedes-Benz, but we don't seem to have the same kind of reaction to them that we do to a Toyota or a Honda. It's an issue of competition. And I think we have to take out of the issue that somehow that this is a threat between the U.S. and Japan, or Japan's success in the competitive area. But we should really be looking at this as an, as an ongoing peaceful competition between their entities who want to succeed and our entities who want to succeed. And I think I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, Dean Packard? Well, I think we have to start by looking at the questions, are the U.S. and Japan enemies? Anybody who would even ask that question, any American who would ask that question, has not been in Japan recently. I would say there is no country in the world except perhaps Canada or England where Americans could be received with more friendship, more genuine warmth, and more admiration. So that question indicates to me that uh, the asker has not been in Japan recently. Secondly, does Japan's success threaten America? Let's look at that question. Japan's success is American success. It was precisely General MacArthur's occupation policy to create a country that was first of all democratic, and Japan is a democracy, second of all a free enterprise uh, with a capitalist country, and it is with certain Japanese flavor attached to it. During the Cold War, in order to build up Japan as an ally, the United States explicitly accepted certain protectionist Japanese practices and encouraged Japan to uh, come into our very open market. That's going to have to change to some extent. But how do you change two democracies from ingrained habits? Japan has the highest per capita income in the world today. Why would a democratic politician stand up there and say, I want to change all this? So it's going to take some very careful, long-term, patient negotiations. And the problem is we are economically interdependent today. The problem is how we change this relationship without fraying tempers on both sides and letting the bureaucrats get so angry that uh, the common sense of the American people and the Japanese people uh, will be overridden. I think that's the major problem, Marvin. Thank you very much, George. Uh, Mr. Shina, your views, please. Yes. Uh, I was introduced uh, the, as a politician, but uh, the, uh, as, as a president, I uh, have been liberated from being a politician, so I, <laughs> I speak about that uh, the, from a very personal point of view. Uh, before I went into uh, the politics, 
I, I would say uh, the owner, uh, founder of a small business which in Japan. I uh, started that uh, from scratch 30 years ago and, and I found out that uh, the Japanese market is very tough. Not uh, only to the foreigners, but to the Japanese, any newcomers. It's a tough market. And so it's like uh, uh, exercising uh, the riding bicycle. You fall many times, but one day you get it and you wonder why you felt so, so often. You know, the Japanese market is tough, but it's a good market if uh, you uh, just stop falling. Uh, that is one, the first point. And uh, I was concerned, uh, the, uh, the one of the, the workers, the saying that centuries and centuries and centuries, uh, Japanese lived their way, and uh, that is so different from ours. The, however, hard working, I think, is a tradition of Americans. You know, you have a tradition of hard working for centuries. Uh, please do not forget that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kawaguchi? I am going to um, basically echo what my previous speakers have said. Um, I would like to say that Japan and the U.S., two countries, are so close to each other and so interdependent. Um, you may know that Japan is the largest market for the United States for agricultural products. And Japan is the second largest market for America of American industrial products. Um, in terms of um, investment, Japan is the second largest investor in the United States, next to the United Kingdom. U.S. Uh, is the largest investor in Japan. So when two countries are that close and that interdependent, I think to ask a question whether Japan's success is a threat to America, um, just is not <coughs> focusing uh, on the right issue. Uh, we have various issues that we have to tackle with, uh, like environment, global warming, energy saving, uh, technology, and also uh, free trade. So the questions that we, would be, we should be asking ourselves is that uh, what we can do together to uh, cope with these issues and how we recognize each other's roles in doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Nye? Yeah, there's a good deal of talk nowadays about Japan and the U.S. becoming uh, enemies. I was surprised to read recently one of my colleagues talking about a new Cold War between the United States and Japan, replacing the old one between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, another writer, popular writer, has used the metaphor of containment, that we should contain Japan. I think these are profoundly misleading. To take uh, images like this from the military area, transfer them to the economic area, is to neglect the point that in economics you can have joint gains. Both sides can be better off from success. But at the same time, it's worth putting in the footnote to that, which is there are some areas of behavior which are not normal, fair market competition. There are times when Japan has targeted American industries and where it hasn't had opening uh, that's symmetrical. There are times when American companies cannot get access to buy a Japanese company, whereas the Japanese company can get access to buy the American company. These things exist. It's, those are appropriate times for governments to take a tough line and to say, you have to change this. But let's not let that spill over into some sort of grandiose metaphor about a new Cold War or America and Japan being enemies. And yet it's clear that there's a problem or we wouldn't be here. And, uh, and there is an underlying sense of dissatisfaction, I suppose, perhaps on, on both sides. And we do speak about Japan as a superpower, as an economic superpower. And Paul Solman, in his second tape package, addresses the simple question, may Japan become 
a superpower. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the world has been hoping that the very definition of the word superpower would change. That economic and cultural power would be more important than military might, that butter would finally prevail over guns. Unfortunately, Saddam Hussein has reminded us that in this technological world, military might may be as important as ever. The crowning of a new emperor in Japan, and the world comes to pay homage. Japan, after all, has taken its place among the world's top economic powers. Is the country on its way to becoming a military power as well? It's footage like this that has some Americans wondering. The very small, very smart video bombs of the Persian Gulf conflict. In the U.S. it's been called the Nintendo War. And indeed, Japanese companies are the world leaders in miniaturized electronic technology. If the wars of the future will be technologically driven, then some people wonder who will be better able to drive them than the Japanese. In Japan, such worries are seen by many as pure nonsense. The Japanese people took to the streets en masse to resist the idea of sending troops to Iraq when war first flared. In the Diet, the Japanese parliament, military participation in the Persian Gulf was defeated in spite of Japan's clear economic interest in the region. Japan's constitution, adopted in the wake of World War II, expressly prohibits the country from having offensive military forces. But the Japanese anti-war sentiment runs far deeper than words on paper can express. For decades, the Japanese have kept the memory of Hiroshima burning. The runaway militarism of the 1930s that led to war is said to be a shameful aberration in Japanese history. But many Americans see Japan as having a long tradition of militarism. Japan has been ruled by warriors throughout much of its recorded history. And in the 1930s, after decades of civilian rule, the Japanese military took over the government once again, fielding armed forces as strong and disciplined as any in the world. Attacks on China and Pearl Harbor established for many a lingering image of Japan the aggressor. The Japanese point to the very same history to make a very different case. Through centuries of both military and civilian rule, Japan remained isolationist, showing very little interest in foreign expansion. It was America's Admiral Perry who forced Japan to open itself to the West in the late 1800s. Japan learned its military imperialism by observing and modeling the behavior of Europe and the United States. Furthermore, compared to other societies throughout history, the Japanese record of outward military expansion is relatively modest. But today, some Americans note, Japan has an army once again. It's called a self-defense force. And although Japan spends only 1% or so of its GNP on the maintenance of its military, the military budget is the third largest in the world. Moreover, Japan has licensed the latest military technology from the United States, including the Patriot missile. And Japan is building the next generation of America's premier fighter, the F-16. If Japan is not intent on becoming a military superpower, once again, skeptics ask, why is it investing so heavily in military hardware? To the Japanese, the answer is obvious. Defense. Throughout its history, island nation Japan has felt itself vulnerable. And who would argue with a people's right to defend themselves? The Japanese insist that their current investment in defense is not an effort to become an offensive military threat. Since World War II, Japan's defense strategy has been to become an economic power. Thus, its survival now depends on open markets throughout the world, as Edwin Reischauer explained in his last lecture. Japan, as she has industrialized, has become absolutely dependent upon foreign resources of energy, <coughs> foreign resources of materials of all sorts. She can't live without them. To do this, she has to have trade and markets. There has to be a world trading system that is open to all. But what if those markets close? And what if America becomes belligerent toward Japan? 
As military troubles flare up around the world, the question is, for how long can the Japanese stay out of the fray? They may not yet have the will to militarize, but arguably, in the era of technological warfare, they already have the way. Paul Selman makes a very interesting point there among a, a number in stressing that 1% of the Japanese budget is devoted to defense. And I remember, in an ironic way, one administration, one American administration after another, urging the Japanese, when they were not spending 1% on defense, to please get it up to 1% on defense and to please um, play a larger defensive role in the northern uh, Pacific. Mr. Wada, I'd like to hear your comments on that five-minute tape package. I think uh, superpower, I believe, uh, has to have a few qualifications. You have to be, you have to excel, you have to have supremacy in, of course, military power and economic power, and then also political leadership in the world. And I believe also more qualifications. In order to be superpower in the world, you have to have all those four, and you must be dedicated to look after the those who are less fortunate. Japan relied upon US supreme military power. We have US Japan security pact and we are under your umbrella. United States wants us to be stronger, spending more than 1% so that we would be less burdened to you, but still it will remain that United States will be a superpower. But it is a great responsibility and challenge for you. And the Japan must cooperate because two things, you are our big brother, and we are under your protection. Japan, now in the United States, trying to learn to be a good corporate citizen. We have to look after other people. Japan continues to look after our own people, but also learn from the United States, look after other people. In this position, I think Japan will stay. Japan will continue to have our own constitution, uh, which prohibits us to have offensive military power. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wada. Uh, Mr. Rapp? It strikes me, in looking at that, that the Japanese are too smart to become, want to become a superpower. <laughs> their whole post-war history is, uh, their economic success is, to a large degree, or to certainly a certain degree, is built on the fact that they didn't have a lot of military expenditures. I can't see why Japan would want to take a successful uh, political economic uh, situation which they have succeeded in developing, uh, which as some people pointed out, Japan has now has the highest per capita income in the world, and shifting that into some sort of a military um, genre. It doesn't make any sense, and I can't see the Japanese being that foolish. Uh, Dean Packer, Japan is a military superpower in addition to an economic one? No, I don't see it, Marvin. I, well, there is only one superpower, and that's America. And I know that because Professor Nye has written it in his excellent book, uh, <laughs> Bound to Lead. I recommend it to all of you. Uh, but, and his response will be, therefore, more relevant than mine. But I really think that uh, there are a number of built-in factors which will prevent Japan from becoming a superpower. First of all, if you look at the war in the Persian Gulf, only one country could have done that. And Japan had no stomach for it. When Prime Minister Kaifu presented a plan to even send a few, even non-military uh, personnel to the Gulf War, the Diet was in total confusion, could not agree on what to do. The Japanese people are deeply pacifistic and will not easily accept a new uh, role of either exporting arms or troops abroad. <coughs> And that is something Americans can welcome. So I think there is a much bigger role for Japan. It cannot go on just spending 1% of GNP for defense, while American taxpayers uh, give up to 6% of GNP for defense. What should that role be? Certainly economic aid to the troubled sections of the world, and certainly a, a real possibility support for the United Nations in all its uh, aspects, peacekeeping operations. The United Nations has great popularity, I think, in Japan, always has. And it seems to me, uh, under the right political leadership, 
uh, Japanese could be persuaded to both send men and money to support UN peacekeeping operations, which will be increasingly important, I think, as time goes on. Well, and we turn now to a prominent Japanese politician, Mr. Shina. Uh, I agree that uh, the, the, the Japan being a superpower, becoming a superpower, is out of a question. Uh, we, we've seen the video. Uh, it indicates the, uh, the uh, high-tech used in uh, the Gulf War. And uh, the caption was uh, mentioning Japan, but the, it is the American high-tech deployed in the Gulf War, and it is a result of a, the well-planned uh, and well-implemented effort of the United States. It has very little to do with uh, the, Amer the Japanese high-tech. Uh, that is one thing. So uh, the piecemeal uh, technology cannot make a military superpower. I'd like to mention, uh, you know, we have experienced the Hiroshima bombing. And that's a, a stone commemorating our bad experience. It said, uh, may it never happen again. Uh, in your word, may God uh, never make it happen again. Uh, compare the word with remember Pearl Harbor. You know, it's different. I think it's it's a uh, it's good thing. You know, uh, we hate fighting. By heart, regardless of uh, who. But. Uh, there is a reality in the world community in which we have to engage ourselves. So if the uh, sense of responsibility uh, comes out of this uh, basic uh, pacifism, I think Japan's uh, definition, own definition of their role in the, in the world will be a wonderful one. Very, very interesting indeed. Minister uh, Kawaguchi, I know that your responsibility is primarily commerce at the embassy, but I'd like to hear your views about the subject. Too. Um, I think there is no question that the U.S. is the leader. And um, Japan, as has been mentioned, we have uh, this um, deeply rooted pacifism within the uh, public that we are not ready to use military forces beyond self-defense purposes. Therefore, when we talk about uh, superpower, the, the role that the United States plays in the world and Japan plays in the world um, are not the same. Uh, in that sense, um, our economic role was mentioned. And uh, I would like to say that already in 1989, if I remember correctly, our official development assistance aid to the third world countries was the largest in the world. So uh, I think Japan is already assuming uh, certain roles in the world in that um, respect, but I don't think we are willing to um, play any military, military role. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Nye, your latest book, Bound to Lead, has already gotten one plug, but now we'd like your thoughts. Well, a year ago, there was a uh, widespread view that Germany and Japan both were becoming the new superpowers and the United States was in decline. In fact, uh, uh, when an eminent uh, declinist reviewed my book, uh, he wrote uh, that now with the Cold War over, military power won't matter anymore, and military power is the only thing the Americans have left. Well, I think he was wrong on a couple of counts. Uh, I think Saddam Hussein drove some tanks right through that argument that military power doesn't matter. But in addition, it's worth noticing that the success in the Gulf War didn't just come from hard power. It also came from what I call soft power, the ability to use coalitions to develop coalitions. In this case, those 12 UN resolutions were critical to being able to have troops in the Persian Gulf area on Arab soils, to have Arab allies, to get contributions from Germany, Japan, and others. I hope that Japan actually will invest more not in military power, but in soft power, the idea of using more Japanese resources through the UN strikes me as all to the good, because many of the types of problems that we're going to have to cope with 
in an age of increasing interdependence are indeed going to require coalitions and cooperation. Uh, in that sense, I think we should welcome Japan's greater role and not get too worried about this question about is Japan becoming a superpower. Or another way of putting it is a direct answer to the question is may Japan become a superpower? The answer is only if the Americans act very, very foolishly. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to ask a question of Mr. Shina because uh, you spoke with such passion and, and insight about um, Japanese uh, concerns about becoming a, a military superpower. Uh, do you think that there is any uh, desire now in the Japanese political establishment to change the Constitution so that that might become possible in the future? Uh, there are people who want that. Uh, I'm one of them. In preamble of the uh, Constitution, uh, frankly, it said that uh, uh, except Japan, the the world is full of good people, peace loving, and so forth. It is not the reality. So, I do not think uh, it is a good thing to have a highest uh, law of a country which tell a lie. Mr. Wada, um, I remember Senator Mansfield, when he was ambassador to Japan many years, um, raised an interesting point time and time again, and that was that Japan, if it does not assume a larger defense role with respect at least to the Northern Pacific, it will never understand what that responsibility really is, and it could not fully mature as a nation. And so I get back to the same question again about a, a redrafting of the constitutional guidelines to give Japan that kind of an opportunity if you feel that the Japanese political establishment would welcome that. I think uh, uh, as we see Soviet uh, military weakened and lose uh, leadership in their own hegemony, and if the United States does not stay as a real superpower, we may be forced to have something because we depend upon your umbrella. And if your umbrella is going to be broken or not going to be there, not countable, I think uh, there will be shift in sentiments and then we may change the constitution because we will have to look after the North Pacific and Asia area. Uh, it is very conceivable. Uh, Dean Packard, what is, is your view about the extent to which Japan should or should not assume a larger defense role? I am a little surprised to hear uh, the Honorable Moto Shina talk about changing the Constitution. Uh, maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I, I don't like to see whole constitutions opened up. I wouldn't like to see Americans have a constitutional convention because we might lose Article I freedom of speech. Polls show that in some cases. And uh, I also worry about what other things might happen. If I could be sure that Mr. Shina would be prime minister and that his policies would uh, be followed, then I would be more comfortable. But it seems to me there is a uh, strong stream of nationalism, right-wing nationalism in Japan, that would like to do other things. That would like to elevate the emperor to a higher position, do some other things which might not be consonant with Japan's long-term national interests. So I guess we might dis differ on that point. Uh, please. Please do not uh, the, the misunderstand me. Uh, the review of uh, the Constitution doesn't mean the, in, the expansion of military power. Well, um, uh, we could go on in this, and I know, but we do have to uh, move on. Uh, Paul Soman has prepared this third uh, videotape package, which introduces the third element uh, here, and the question he raises, does America threaten Japan's soul? Thank you so very much. Welcome the TV game show Family Feud, not exactly the pinnacle of American culture. Family Feud, the Japanese knockoff. After years of copying and improving on America's best products, from autos to VCRs, 
The Japanese now seem to be copying our worst ones. More and more, they look like Americans, seem to act like Americans. For the Japanese, this raises a vital question. Does America threaten Japan's soul? But for Americans, the question often is, are the Japanese really changing? Japan calls itself the land where the sun rises, and many Japanese think of their culture as unique. Their soul as largely impenetrable by non-Japanese. The Japanese way of life arises from a long cultural tradition that emphasizes the group. Other Japanese characteristics follow from this group identity. Strong family values, hard work. The traditional ethic of the educated warrior, the samurai of feudal times, has also helped define Japanese national character, with its emphasis on duty and self-discipline. Since Japan was forcibly opened by America nearly 150 years ago, Japanese have worried about losing their uniqueness, as Professor Edwin Reischauer was fond of pointing out in his Harvard lectures. There's been this horrible fear that they were going to lose their souls, they're going to be turned into second-rate white men, second-rate Westerners, just imitators and so on. Americans, on the other hand, have been heartily encouraged by Japan's apparent westernization. It's been a source of American reassurance for generations. When Japanese adopted Western dress in the late 19th century, Americans were encouraged. When Japanese began playing baseball and invited Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth to Japan in 1931, Americans were even more encouraged. World War II saw a rejection of Western values, but soon after, Americans were again comforted by images of the Japanese as quaint copycats, whose Westernization was back on schedule. But behind the stereotypes were dutiful, self-disciplined employees who took low wages and few vacations for the good of company and country. And so today, when Americans see Japanese teenagers getting down, they shouldn't jump to conclusions. People have been predicting the demise of Japan's soul for more than a century. But now, as we look at Japan, after more than a hundred years of this experience, we see that Japan is a very, very Japanese nation. If there's any problem, it is too Japanese. They're still too singular, too different from everybody else. The Japanese have retained their own identity, their own soul, their own spirit, their own way of doing things extremely strongly. It looks like a U.S. baseball game. But America's national pastime has been adapted to Japan's national character. We, the players, have practiced all year and now hope to play at our full potential in this tournament. We would like to do our best to contribute to the development of high school baseball and the glory of our schools. In Japan, the group still comes first. To many Americans, Japan seems to be changing too slowly. But to many Japanese, Japan is changing too fast. They fear that the Japanese soul, the national character that propelled their society to world prominence, is still in peril. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer. How does a country, uh, how does a country lose its soul? Mr. Wada, you can take the first crack at that one. Fine. I think uh, Japanese are enjoying American creative entertainment. And there's nothing wrong in enjoying American creative entertainment. Uh, occasionally, I go back to Japan. I participate in uh, tea ceremony. Uh, I go see the movies with the old time just to, uh, Japanese samurai movies. Uh, in the samurai movies, they still continue to cherish the obligation, sacrificing yourself for someone, sacrificing yourself for your master, even in the corporations, companies. Uh, many of us will take great delight uh, working hard for uh, all the friends who are in the same company because we feel we are sharing the fate. Company goes down, we go, go down. Country goes down, we go down. 
So we feel we still retain, I think, all the Japanese tradition. So I think uh, you are not going to threaten Japan's soul. Please export your entertainment to Japan. <laughs> we enjoy it. Okay. Thank uh, you. Bill Rapp? Well, Mr. Watt is in a very good position, of course, to make sure that happens because of... <laughs> <laughs> Is that a reference to the Sony Corporation? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and their acquisition of Columbia and CBS Records and so on. The, no, uh, we're not taking that to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Only software. <laughs> the, um, this question, I guess, the question is why was this question asked? And uh, one, I guess, partly it's a sense of balance. The first two sides were uh, sort of is Japan a threat to the U.S. and to balance that we have to now as is, is well as in fact is America a threat to Japan. If we are a threat to their soul and Japan is becoming more like America then eventually we won't have to deal with it because if they're like Americans we'll understand them and there won't be any problems. <laughs> and again it, I think that that's a mistake. Uh, I, as Mr. Wada said and I guess the rest of the panel is Japan will be different. In reality the they're always going to be different. And to ask this question seems to me to make a mistake. What we really should be saying is, uh, can the U.S. and Japan work together even if we don't understand each other completely? And that's where I'd like to leave it. You know, a, uh, a British <laughs> diplomat once told an American reporter, it's too bad that we both speak English so well because it covers up the differences between us. Uh, Dean Packer. I think we just heard Professor Reichauer say it very well, and in the last chapter of his last book about the Japanese, he warned Japan, it's a danger to, to think that you're too unique, too Japanese, too different. And now we can see this coming back with a vengeance and becoming a threat to Japan as follows. Um, and since there's no so-called revisionist on this panel, as far as I know, uh, let me just tell you what is the revisionist line now. The revisionist line is that the Japanese themselves say they are different different system, different form of capitalism, different values. Therefore, American trade policy should treat Japan as different and put up various kinds of uh, barriers, protectionist, or force open the Japanese market and so forth. And that may be where we have to go eventually if we fail in these other more incremental efforts to change the relationship. But uh, it seems to me uh, that Japan could therefore be ho hoisted on its own petard and that basically Japan is not that different. Americans and Japanese are not that different, different. and all our major values, such as equality and opportunity, are enshrined in the Japanese Constitution and in our Constitution, and both Constitutions have been uh, widely accepted. So let's not get so hung up on the differences that we forget, uh, we, as human beings, uh, we have much more in common than, uh, than different. Mr. Sheena, any uh, danger to uh, Japan's soul? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, uh, the, those entertainment, uh, sports, and so forth are uh, very uh, sufficient thing, and we don't have to worry about that. And if uh, the, uh, the every country is the same, uh, we'll lose uh, big industry, tourism. Uh, <laughs> not be interesting. Uh, rather, you know, I think uh, that we have to try to import more uh, the good things uh, they, they from uh, other countries. For instance, uh, the uh, very the usually uh, too many, too, too often in Japan, uh, United States is considered to be a very materialistic kind of people. Uh, they, however, uh, if uh, you come to the Harvard and uh, involved in this uh, kind of atmosphere, you uh, the value very highly the intellectual element of the society. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kawaguchi? As a mother of two children, I think I can say that neither my <coughs> husband nor I have ever thought of that question in bringing up my, our children. We um, never worried about American influence threatening our children's Japanese soul. Um, I think the important thing is that the children are brought up with, um, with a mind which, are flexible in, which is flexible enough
to accept foreign culture. It is important, I think, that uh, we, um, we do not say that other countries' system is wrong because it's not the same as our own. And I think it's important for both of us to keep that in mind because quite often um, these days two countries get into a, a conflict saying that something is wrong simply because it's not the same as our, our own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Nye? Well, this is a case where I think we have the wrong end of the question. Uh, Japanese culture is enormously robust. It, the question is not will Japanese culture be robust, but perhaps it's too robust for Japan's own interests. Japanese intellectuals talk about the problem of internationalization of Japan, of being able to adapt attitudes so they can develop and uh, views of a more interdependent world which allow them to participate more effectively. And let me just give you a few examples of where they haven't done this well enough. Uh, look at the question of Nobel Prizes, which some Japanese have brought up. Why so few Japanese Nobel Prize winners? Answer, because of too much conformity, perhaps, in the educational system. Uh, or look at the question of immigration. Uh, Japan's population is gradually getting older overall. Demographics are switching. Uh, the Japanese are not very good at importing people. Their culture is very resistant to importing people because of its homogeneity. So I think the question that we should ask is not this one, is Japan's soul threatened? The answer to that is clearly no. But can Japanese culture change at a deeper level? And the answer to that is yes. It's changed enormously in the last century or more. But the question then should be reframed and say, can it change fast enough to allow Japan to play the new roles it will need to play an interdependent world? Very, very interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it is uh, time now to go to the audience, and if there are any questions, uh, please ask them. Question is a question briefly expressed. Right here, please. I'd like to ask the Japanese panelists if they feel that there's a change going on. The Japanese people themselves, they're starting to stress the similarities opposed to differences. For example, trade negotiations and such. Japan saying that we are different, we are the exception. Dean Packard, you had a I think maybe comment. the questioner is uh, referring to some of the silly things that get said during trade negotiations. For example, Japanese snow is different, therefore we can't import skis. Japanese intestines are longer, therefore we can't have American beef, and so forth. Uh, and these have been said by important people. But the, I think we are making some progress now in that we can laugh at that with each other. And, uh, but I come back to the question of, these, are these issues too important to be left to the bureaucrats? and especially bureaucrats who have been in the trenches for years are angry, even begin to hate each other across the table. Uh, my view is that they are too important and that the highest levels of political leadership on each side are going to have to have a new deal, a new shuffle of the cards, new roles and responsibilities, maybe a Pacific charter. Thank you. Question in the uh, balcony, please. I'd like to ask about the Japanese consumption of tropical timber. The, uh, I believe it was the Commerce uh, Minister mentioned briefly the environment um, and uh, the question of biodiversity, the forests of the Philippines are 90% destroyed, and a lot of that went to Japan, and right now Borneo and New Guinea are at a crucial stage of uh, development decisions. Perhaps Japanese foreign aid could be aimed more at uh, environmental preservation rather than at, at uh, road building. Thank you. <laughs> Would you like to try that? Yes. Well, um, uh, I just... Briefly, I just would like to say that we are spending money in aid in on environmental matters. Um, I, th I think we have a program of spending um, 30, um, 300 billion yen um, in three years in, in the environment. That's part of our efforts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in coping with environment. Thank you. Uh, question in the balcony, please. I would like to know what your opinion of Edward Deming and his impact on the Japanese economy was. I think it gave us a uh, great tool to uh, bring up quality because Deming Award is the most coveted award among Japanese industry. In order to receive it, you have to improve your quality. So I should say, the one of the key elements of Japanese success, which depended upon productivity, quality control, comes from Dr. Deming. I'd like uh, to wrap this up right now by asking our panelists 
very simple question, and I would appreciate a kind of a 20-second answer. If it were up to you, what is the one thing that you would recommend that you think would eliminate questions like are Japan and America enemies? What is the one thing that you would do? Just one thing. Yeah, just More one. Japanese to speak up and get to know the people. Good. Dean Packer? I would make it mandatory that a Japanese company doing business in America have American board members and American companies doing business in Japan have Japanese citizens as board members there, cross membership. Thank you. Minister? Uh, to do more things together, like um, technology cooperation or efforts in many areas, and to prove that these things work so that people will have more confidence Excellent. in better relationship. Thank you. Professor Nye? You know, the uh, Japanese, I think, should try to welcome more foreigners, for example, more foreign students in Japanese universities, more foreign directors on Japanese corporate boards. And uh, I think the Americans should uh, not be so paranoid. Uh, they should <laughs> become more relaxed about the potential threat from Japan and see some of the benefits as well as some of the costs. Mr. Shina? Uh, I agree with uh, almost uh, everybody here. Uh, increase the chance to work together. And also, one more thing is uh, that both sides should be, should have a self-confidence so that uh, uh, they can be generous enough to learn from each other. I guess I would say to try to avoid putting labels or trying to look for the simple view of our relationship with Japan, but take it in its complexity and its richness. And to help that, I would like to see maybe a program between the U.S. and Japanese government to actively introduce a maybe history of Japan or a Japanese study course into all of the uh, public schools in the United States. And I would say let's have more programs like this. And in conclusion, I'd like to ask Reverend Vetter to stand up, please. On behalf of Cambridge Forum, the Institute of Politics, our visible audience, and our large but invisible radio and television audiences. I want to thank you very much for being with us for this event. Special thanks to the co-sponsor of this event, the Institute of Politics of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. The basic Cambridge Forum co-sponsors are the First Parish in Cambridge, Unitarian Universalist. The Lowell Institute, Boston. The United Ministry at Harvard and Radcliffe, Interfaith. The MIT Chaplains, Interfaith. Support for this program is from the First Parish in Cambridge, the Sasakawa Foundation, the Lowell Institute.